All right, so welcome everyone. Good evening and thank you for joining us uh, at our Heritage Hour. We're grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with us tonight. My name is Erin D. Richard, um, and I'm the Curator Supervisor at the Oil Museum of Canada, located in Oil Springs. I'll be the moderator for tonight's Heritage Hour, titled Rough Waters, Shipwrecks of Lambton's Past. Over the next hour, we'll hear stories that focus on the dark and dangerous side of the local nautical history. Lambton Ca County is bordered by two important bodies of water, the St. Clair River and Lake Huron. Our local industries are intrinsically tied to the shipping and transportation along these waters. And this nautical history has its share of dark moments, which we'll be exploring tonight. With me are five representatives from the Heritage Sarnia Lambton Museum Network for our 10th Heritage Hour and the first one of 2023. So if you're interested in viewing some of our previous discussions, you can access them online at the heritagelampton.ca or on the Lambton County Archives YouTube channel. Um, I'm also recording tonight's uh, presentation, so if you want to watch again or share it with your family and friends, it will be available online. We'll send an e-blast with a link for everyone to, that registered tonight, um, and they'll be able to access the video then. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, um, or you can type it in the chat. I'll read out the questions after all the panelists have shared their presentations. You can also access the chat box where you can make comments and talk with the other attendees. Just be sure you're sending your messages to all attendees and not just the panelists if you want everyone to see it. So we can start things off tonight by you sharing with us where you're joining us from. I'll be introducing each of our presenters as we go and we'll finish our evening with some updates from our community museums and, uh, and the Q&A. So our first presenter tonight is Nicole Aslaw. She is the Archivist Supervisor of the Lambton County Archives located in Wyoming, Ontario. Nicole holds a degree in classical archaeology with a minor in ancient languages and a postgrad in museum and gallery studies. She's currently pursuing an Executive Master of Business Administration with a specialization in innovation leadership from the University of Fredericton. Go ahead, uh, Nicole, you can share your screen. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I should probably click the button and share and slideshow, maybe. There we go, it's just a little slow tonight. All right, everybody can hear me okay, I assume. So tonight I'm gonna talk about the story of the Shiprock Fontana, which I, it, honestly began on August 3rd, 1900, and uh, it spanned multiple months after. So a little bit about the Fontana, built in 1888 by Simon Langell, or Langell in East China, St. Clair, Michigan, the Fontana was a large wooden schooner, just over 231 feet in length and 38 feet in width. For years, she carried heavy cargo for her operator, Edward Rector, St. Clair Steamship Company. On August 3rd, 1900, the Fontana bound for Cleveland with a full load of iron ore was being towed by the steamer Cayuga in Lower Lake Huron. It was a Friday evening and most of the crew were on the deck catching glimpses of the approaching lights of Port Huron. Constant vigilance was needed by the ships when navigating through the St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair and the Detroit River due to um, shallower depth and kind of the smaller size of the waterways. At around midnight, the Fontana and Cayuga were cruising past the Gratiot Lighthouse when the steamer Appomattox was about to emerge from the river, uh, towing the schooner Santiago, which was loaded with coal. Short distance behind, following in the Santiago's wake, was the schooner the Inter Ocean. So the crew aboard the Cayuga made out the lights of all three outbound vessels approaching from the American side of the river. As opposed to having them move to the other side, the Cayuga put out two blasts of their whistle indicating their intention to pass the vessels on the Canadian side. The Appomattox responded. The Cayuga moved to the Canadian side and the signal was given for full steam ahead. Before attaining much speed, however, the Santiago emerged side by side with the Cayuga, with the Santiago swinging toward the steamer. 
The Cayuga made a hard starboard turn to avoid collision with the Santiago, which second later did miss a collision. However, it did graze the Cayuga stern with its starboard bow. In all of the frenzy and excitement, the wheelsmen of the Cayuga responded quickly and signaled to the Fontana to steer toward the Canadian shore. The Fontana immediately responded, and it was as it turned at this unfortunate angle that the Santiago's bow crashed right into the Fontana starboard bow, just forward of what was the ship's rigging. And the ship started, so the, the Fontana started filling with water really fast, and most of the crew filled the lifeboat. Unfortunately, because constant vigilance was needed, um, two sailors had gone to bed early to take the early morning shift, and so they were below deck and they were asleep. And they missed the launch of the lifeboat, but they did wake up. They raced to the ship's rigging. One made it to safety, but unfortunately, the other, John McGregor, did not. The Fontana stunk, or stunk, stunk uh, with her stern out of the water and lying as she was so close to the shipping lanes just upstream of what's now the Blue Water Bridge, just to put it all in perspective, uh, it really became a menace for ship navigation. So two boys were placed on the westerly edge of the channel marking the wreck, which really, as you can see in the screen, was just, just below the top of water in the section, so really mere feet below water. And it was to warn other vessels of this wreck. Unfortunately, within 48 hours of its sinking, another vessel collided with the Fontana, and subsequently other vessels, several other vessels, experienced narrow escapes except for the Kingfisher Schooner, which was in tow of the Samuel Marshall, who collided very heavily with the wreck and remained grounded on the wreck for multiple hours. So because the wreck did have a substantial cargo of iron ore, uh, despite hopes of the ship's owner raising the Fontana, the complexity and the size of the wreck, uh, most wrecking companies basically said it was near impossible. And think about even the um, river itself, it's a very fast moving current as well. So while wrecking companies talked to the busy waterway, uh, it continued to have a lot of close calls. However, unfortunately on September 21st, 1900, so just over a month later, uh, the schooner John B. Martin was being towed through the river and made every attempt to avoid the Fontana, which in turn caused a collision with the propeller of another ship called the Yuma, which caused the John B. Martin to sink and four additional lives to be lost. Uh, so now you have two shipwrecks, basically on either side of the channel. And so one week later, um, the A.J. McBriar made an attempt uh, to clear the what was now the two shipwrecks, and it did so, tried to do so without assistance, which unfortunately led to another loss of life when it did clip one of the wrecks and um, it also caused additional damage to the schooner before it, it did eventually make its, its way through. But like I said, unfortunately, there was another loss of life there. Uh, so finally, uh, realizing the Fontana was not gonna be lifted, uh, M. Sullivan of Detroit was contracted to use a dredge named the Gladiator to essentially pull the wreck to pieces and break it apart. And then whatever could not be broken apart, they used dynamite to fulfill the rest of his contract. And so they blew up the rest of the ship to get the required 25 foot depth of the wreck uh, below the water. So scattered down the river that starts near the initial wreck by the Blue Water Bridge, it remains, and what it remains is a dynamited stern, windlass, capstan, and gearbox. So that is a short little history on a shipwreck that caused multiple other shipwrecks, as well as unfortunately, multiple losses of life. Thanks. Wow, thank you, Nicole. That was, I mean, it wasn't uh, so tragic. It was a little comical with all the, the boats, but. Um, or I rather ships. Um, all right, so our next uh, presenter is uh, Professor Greg Stock. Greg currently teaches history at the University College of the North out of Thompson, Manitoba. He grew up in Arcona and has published studies on Arcona, Port Franks, and Witter. Greg, thanks for joining us, and you can go ahead and uh, share your presentation if you have one.
It oh. says its host is disabled. Sorry. Yep. I because he joined last. There you go. Now you should be able to do it. There we go. Perfect. Can everyone see that? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about Port Franks and the Great Storm of November 1913, and specifically, there's a, um, Port Franks uh, is, of course, a, a community on this uh, the Savo River uh, and and Lake Huron. So it's inextricably tied to um, the storms on the lake and so on. And the community's history was dependent on access to the lake. And there were any number of stories I could have talked about. There were numerous shipwrecks. Uh, that um, beset the community going back to at least the 1850s. Uh, and in fact, the Squatter Cemetery in Port Franks, which was formally given recognition in 2015, is the presumed burial place of many shipwreck victims who washed up ashore and the villagers interned them in the cemetery or interred them in the cemetery. But I'm going to focus my attentions again on the, stor the storm of 1913. I think most people often associate Port Franks with the rather placid fishing grounds of the Asabo River, but of course, um, the reality is that the lake can be incredibly tempestuous. Um, and here are just a couple of images uh, of Port Franks at the turn of the last century. Um, it was very small. Um, it had a, probably a permanent population at that time of only around 60 people. The uh, topographical map here uh, is ostensibly from 1914. It was published in 1914, um, but it doesn't show the dramatic change that had occurred in 1912 when the river actually punched uh, out directly into the lake in a more direct channel. And this map, which is from the 1940s, shows the topography as it existed at the time of the 1913 storm. So Port Franks was an out of the way place. It was very much based on, um, uh, there had been milling and various activities, but by the beginning of the 20th century, it had become a tourist place in the summer months with the hotels uh, and summer resorts there. So I think most people know about the, the great storm of 1913. It was one of the most devastating storms to beset the Great Red Lakes region. Uh, it caught dozens of ships uh, in, in, in its wake, and many of the ships were sent to the bottom, uh, and the majority of the ships were lost on Lake Huron. I'm going to talk about the comparatively lucky Northern Queen. The Northern Queen uh, was heading up the lake and left Sarnia uh, and Port Huron at 9.30 p.m. on the Sunday night of the November the 9th. The storm was picking up speed and, and, and growing in ferocity. And the Northern Queen was barely making any headway. The waves were crashing over it, and it was it was an incredible struggle to get up the lake. At one point, the Northern the captain of the Northern Queen decided he was going to try and return to the relative safety of the St. Clair River, but was signaled by another vessel that it would be foolhardy to attempt to turn and return. So he tried to ride out the storm as best he could, but ultimately what happened was the waves were smashing the vessel, and in fact the captain and crew felt the ship was going to break apart. They were absolutely terrified. And then uh, what happened was that the a major wave slammed into the rear of the ship, broke open the windows, and ultimately the water poured in, put out the, uh, the boilers, which could have exploded, uh, and rendered the ship completely helpless. Uh, the rudder chains were broken, and the ship was then completely left to the whims of the, of the, the mother nature. Fortunately, the ship was driven aground at the mouth or near the mouth of the Sable River at Port Franks, um, but the nightmare of the crew can only be imagined. Um, they were stranded there for 12 hours, no heat, uh, the water was pouring in, and they were expecting at any moment that they would be pounded into uh, smithereens and lost. But the reality ultimately was when light broke on Monday morning, the some of the crew, nine crew members, managed to launch the only surviving lifeboat. The other had been smashed to pieces. And the nine crew members managed to get the ship into the heavy heaving waves. Um, they apparently, in their haste, were supposed to take a line with them uh, if they made it to shore to secure a connection to the ship. They seem to have forgotten to do that in their panic. Uh, amazingly, the the uh, boat managed to make it to Thor, um, but then the fact was half of the crew was still left stranded on the Northern Queen. 
Uh, villagers uh, were quickly alerted to the fact that there was a ship uh, stranded just off the shoreline. And we have three images here showing uh, the ship where it was very close to shore, but they might as well have been in the middle of the lake. Ultimately, what happened was uh, the crew on board ship tried to send a line uh, to land using a plank, et cetera, but these failed. Finally, what happened was villagers, Archie Jameson and Mr. Cap Captain James Rayburn, uh, to incredibly heroically launched another boat from the village into the waves. They eventually managed to get close enough to the ship that a steel hawser was thrown off. They managed to retrieve it, uh, and then they used this to fix to the land, and then they went out and they managed to ferry the various crew members off of the ship uh, in two, um, two uh, tries. They finally took, at 9 o'clock p.m. on Monday, they managed to take off the captain and the first mate. Uh, unfortunately, um, the reality is Mr. Jameson was holding on to the steel hawser, nearly lost his fingers um, holding on to this, and um, he survived. And on the last trip back, the boat slammed into a um, sandbar. The crew had to get out in the water, dislodge the boat. In, and remember, this is November. The water was freezing. The crew had already been subjected to many hours of horror and, and, and without heat, et cetera. They managed to get the boat unstuck. Then they made it to shore where villagers met them. They got the rush, the crew bundled them up and took them to Hasselwood House or the Waverly Hotel where Mrs. Hasselwood uh, gave them blankets and hot food and so on. Uh, the ship of course survived and they counted themselves as incredibly fortunate because of course, uh, many other ships went down and all hands were lost. The reality was that Port Frank's residents quickly became aware of the loss of other vessels because what was quickly becoming apparent was the shoreline, the beaches were being um, littered with the cargo of all kinds of different ships. Uh, in fact, the villagers spoke of the fact that crates upon crates uh, were blow, um, washing ashore. This was just before Christmas season. Many of the crates contained Christmas candy, um, there were oil tanks, there were all kinds of merchandise and so forth that was washing ashore. Port Franks was not a wealthy community and the villagers and people from the surrounding countryside immediately took action, went down to the beach to gather what they could. This was, they considered this something that they could potentially make use of or sell and so on. It was said later, insurance adjusters showed up and villagers became very savvy at hiding these uh, goods in various locations throughout the village. Unfortunately, a more sobering reality was that um, ultimately about a dozen bodies also washed on shore. Um, and in fact, it was said that one boat believed to be from the uh, SS Regina made it to shore with two sailors sitting bolt upright in the boat, but they were frozen to death. Um, one woman went down to the shore and ultimately found a sailor washed in the shallows and she and her friend dragged the frozen body out of the water. Ultimately, um, the fact was that the members, uh, the, the crew members were found, the, the victims were found to be from the Regina and the Wexford. Um, and one woman who I managed to interview 20 some odd years ago, uh, was four years old at the time. Her father, the local undertaker from Thedford, was called to come into Port Franks to take care of the bodies that had washed the shore. And he came to her father and asked to borrow his wagon to go down to the beach to bring the bodies back. And she said, her mother said, don't look out the window. Well, telling a four-year-old not to look out the window um, Obviously, she was filled with curiosity, and it was. She said she would never forget the sight because she saw her father's wagon coming back into the village with bodies stacked, frozen bodies stacked like cordwood in the back of the wagon, and that the very severe, uh, lasting impression on a, a, very, a young child at the time. The Northern Queen was ultimately uh, towed, refloated, and uh, would go back to sea service, um, and so it was a harrowing event. Uh, I was told by longtime villagers that for years afterward, um, various parts of ships, uh, cargo, et cetera, would occasionally be um, dislodged from the sand. They'd been buried during the storm. And so there were constant reminders. One woman said that in fact, um, she was disturbed one day when her two young children, uh, this would be in the 1920s, came back to the village hauling uh, rifles that they had found buried on the beach in a case. Um, which had apparently washed ashore from one of the wrecks. So um, 
anyway, the Northern Queen, uh, it's, a, it's a sad story, but it, it, it certainly, they, it was a much happier um, outcome than many of the sailors faced um, in November of 1913. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, that was, uh, I, could, I couldn't imagine discovering years later still things coming to shore. Um, all right, so our, uh, we are next going to hear from Dana Thorne. Dana is the Curator Supervisor at the Lambton Heritage Museum. She has been in that position since 2018. Dana has been working at cultural facilities in the County of Lambton for over 10 years, first as an intern at the Oil Museum of Canada, and then as the archivist at the Lambton County Archives. She completed her BA in History at the University of Alberta and her MA in Public History at Western University. Dana is passionate about telling our local stories and engaging our community, engaging the community in our history. Well, thank you very much, Erin. And thank you to everyone for being with us here for Heritage Hour tonight. Um, I'm joining you from the Lambton Heritage Museum from a section of our uh, new permanent exhibit, which will be opening on June 2nd. Um, and this is our, our on the water theme of the exhibit. So we've got a great uh, enlargement of the Neuronic on the wall behind me there as well as this, uh, this ship's wheel here. That's a great uh, photo opportunity where people can pose and, um, and get some great pictures while they're going through, through the new gallery. So come visit the museum after June 2nd to uh, see the rest of the space for yourselves. Um, and as for the, my presentation tonight, I'm uh, going, also going to speak about uh, the Great Storm of 1913, but I'm going to focus on some of the artifacts in our museum collection that are related to the Great Storm. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. And side note, although uh, not directly related to the Great Storm of 1913, I did listen to the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald while I was preparing my presentation tonight. It's uh, been a staple on my playlist since we lost Gordon Lightfoot a few weeks ago. Um, as Greg mentioned, the Great Storm of 1913 was uh, one of the worst storms to ever hit the Great Lakes. Dozens of cargo ships that were eager to deliver their goods before winter arrived were either destroyed or grounded by the force of the storm. The storm resulted in over 250 fatalities, the destruction of over a dozen ships and caused many more ships to be grounded. The economic loss was also significant. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it's estimated that $100 million worth of goods were lost. A lot of those um, washing up on the uh, shores at Port Franks there. During the Great Storm, Lambton County's picturesque Lake Huron shore was cast into chaos. The storm caused damage on the water and on land, downing power lines, halting transportation, and damaging homes. There was destruction strewn across the beaches, including goods washed ashore from the ships and the bodies of sailors who did not survive the storm. In uh, Lambton Heritage Museum's collection, we have some fascinating artifacts that were left behind from the storm's destruction. My first series of our artifacts all come from the Regina, which was one of the ships that sunk during the Great Storm. On this slide, you can see one of the Regina's empty lifeboats uh, being lifted out of the lake in the aftermath of the storm. The Regina was carrying a variety of different types of merchandise when it was lost on the lake. She rested at the bottom of Lake Huron for 73 years before she was discovered near Port Sanilac, Michigan on July 1st, 1986, uh, Wayne Brissett of Commercial Diving and Marine Services made the discovery of the shipwreck. All of the uh, all of these artifacts recovered from the Regina by um, in the 19, 1980s came with a corresponding certificate of authenticity. On this slide is a glass pint bottle that came from the shipwreck. In our collections catalog, it was identified as a whiskey bottle, but I'm not sure. Um, but now it's no longer has whiskey. It's filled to the brim with sand and dirt. That uh, certificate of authenticity has also been reproduced on this slide. These two wine bottles also came from the wreck of the Regina. Uh, in the green bottle, that presumably tasty wine has been replaced by heaps of sand. There's no marking on either bottle to indicate uh, what their vintage was before they were lost to the bottom of Lake Huron. The bottle on the right of this slide gives away a bit more information about its origins. Uh, there's remnants of a white wax and red paper steel around the sides of the opening. You can see the initials W and M on the bottle, as well as embossed engravings for White and McKay Glasgow. 
White and McKay was a Scotch producer at the time of the Great Storm, and they are still in business today. There's an inch of dark liquid at the bottom of the bottle. I wondered to myself if it was Scotch, but I'm not going to test it to try, try and find out. Spoons and horseshoes are among some of the other items that, um, that were discovered in the wreck and have uh, now part of the museum collection. They are very rusty from their time at the bottom of the lake. I uh, wondered what they might have looked like if they had spent 73 years in the ocean instead of in the lake, because um, I had read that salt water is even more corrosive than, than fresh water. So they, they are not in good shape, but maybe they would have been worse had they sunk in the ocean. This is the uh, final artifacts I'm going to highlight from the wreck of the Regina and it is 19 matchsticks. On this uh, slide, you can also see a copy of the certificate of authenticity. Other artifacts from the Great Storm of 1913 in Lampton Heritage Museum's collection are these red and yellow deck chairs. They washed up on the beach just north of Grand Bend. They were collected by Mr. Hawkins of Exeter. They are an excellent example of how important it is to record the history behind an artifact. Without the context that they washed up on the beach during the great storm, they would just look like two nasty old chairs. The fact that they were part of the storm and were collected from the beach and preserved gives it a very strong history or provenance as we call it in the museum world. It takes these two ordinary deck chairs and makes them extraordinary. This item comes from the collection of our colleagues at the Lambton County Archives. And thank you to uh, Nicole who presented earlier for sharing this. This storm warning was issued at 10, 10 a.m. on November 7th from the Meteorological Service of the Dominion of Canada's Toronto office. It was received by telegraph at the Sarnia office at 11.50 a.m. the same date by agent R. McAdams. It warned to expect heavy gale at first from a westerly direction. At the bottom of the storm warning, it reads, the ordering up of the storm signals is intended to warn those connected with shipping that a storm will probably occur, either at the place at which the signal is displayed or within such a distance that ships leaving port might be affected by it. One of the tragedies of the great storm was that some ship captains chose to ignore the weather warnings and push forward with their cargo into dangerous waters. On the backside of the storm warning are remarks from the agent McAdams about um, the activity during the storm. He recorded signal drum, cone, and lamp blew away <clears throat> during Sunday night storm. Men could not go up Monday, but are repairing damages today. Did not get down message as wires are all down. Got by mail from London, your query why down was not answered, but could not reply by wire as wires are still down. Storm caused many wrecks. We'll mail you copy of paper tomorrow morning with account. Uh, these uh, next feature artifacts also come from a colleague's collection. These two long oars are part of the Forest Museum's collection. And thank you to uh, David McLean for flagging them for me when you heard about my topic. And uh, we'll hear from David a little bit later this evening. These oars are 14 feet in length. They were donated to the Forest Museum in the 1960s by the Wellington family. In the close-up picture, you can see some stenciling on the oars. Forest Museum is doing further research to see if they can determine exactly what ship these oars belong to. They might have belonged to one of the lifeboats from one of the sinking ships, or maybe they belong to one of the rescue ships. Uh, maybe time and more research will be able to shed some light on this. I'm going to close with a poem from an anonymous author, um, and this is part of the Huron County Museum collection. The ninth day of November last will be remembered long. The loss by the storm on that day could not be told in song. On that November morning, the wind and sleet and snow increased until the afternoon. The storm was fierce, I know. Not only on Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and St. Clair, and also Lake Superior, each one received their share. The strongest vessel on the lake will never reach the shore. The bravest sailors on the boats will see their friends no more. Lifeboats and life preservers proved that day to no avail. They were no use that stormy night. They could not stand the gale. Some tried the life preservers. No sailor need be told. It's better to sink at once than perish with the cold. And after that eventful night for one full week or more, there have been many sailors found all along Lake Huron shore. One of them a letter from his mother far away saying, you will be home New Year's. Can't I see you Christmas day? Well, thank you. Uh, that's it for me.
Thank you for joining us tonight and please uh, keep safe on the water this summer. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Thank you for sharing that poem too. It's lovely. We all need more poetry in our lives. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, all right, so next we have uh, Kaylin Shepley, the curator at Sombra Museum. She's been in that position since 2017. Her educational background is in languages and history, and she is currently com completing a program in museum studies. Last year, Kaylin co-authored her first children's book based on experiences at the Sombra Museum. Go ahead, Kaylin. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. So tonight I am going to talk about the sinking of the William H. Wolf. When I was trying to come up with a ship to talk about, I thought I would um, speak about something that's hyper local to the Sombra area. Not only did the wreck sink right south of Sombra, but a lot of locals have dove or fished over the wreck or sailed over the wreck and have mentioned that it has inspired them to start scuba diving or to look into the Great Lakes and marine history. Okay, so first off, the St. Clair River and shipwrecks, a brief history. So ever, ever since the St. Clair River was first explored in the 16th, sorry, the 17th century by um, René de Lestal, uh, the, there have been wrecks. Uh, the channel is, is very difficult to navigate. It's actually a strait rather than a river connecting Lake Huron and Lake St. Clair and the Detroit River to Lake Erie. Uh, the St. Clair River has the largest de um, freshwater delta in the Great Lakes system and separates into five channels uh, south of Sombra. And the channel depth, although due to dredging is an average of 30 to 70 feet. Some spots such as near Fawn Island are as shallow as one foot. So navigating can be very tricky, especially during the days before buoys and radar technology, um, relying on hand-drawn depth charts and um, other sailing information and experience. Occasionally you might get into trouble. Uh, also, during the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, when boilers and steamships uh, ruled the waves, uh, fire was very common on the ships, either in the from a boiler explosion, from the boilers running dry, or from uh, sparks from coal or other sources igniting cargo. So many ships uh, actually caught fire on the St. Clair River. Indeed, um, in the Saint area of the St. Clair River, which in total is 64 kilometers long, uh, the area that covers St. Clair Township, so from Corona south to um, south of Port Lambton, there are over 75 shipwrecks. So it's basically a shipwreck graveyard, with many of them being near Fawn and Stag Island. So the shipwrecks themselves also make navigating the river difficult and have indeed caused further wrecks. Okay, so this photo credit, um, I'd like to thank the Great Lakes um, um, and Mar Milwaukee Public Library, Wisconsin Marine Historical Society for allowing me to use this photo. Uh, this photo is from the launch of the William H. Wolf. So the William H. Wolf is a steamer. It was built by Wolf and Davidson Shipyard in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1887 and was launched on August 6th. Um, the ship, although had a somewhat unremarkable career, did begin with a rather illustrious start. Uh, the day of the ship launch, thousand, several thousand spectators were on hand to watch the newest bulk carrier on the lakes, which would eventually at the time of its sinking be considered the largest bulk carrier on the Great Lakes um, to be launched. Uh, all on his plan until a huge wave slammed into the coal sheds at the fuel company uh, across from the across from the shipyard. Uh, two men died and many were injured when part of the structure they were observing the events from collapsed. Um, 
William H. Wolf, the ship was named after the one of the founders of Wolf and Davidson. He had come to Germany uh, from Germany to the U.S. and he had built a somewhat of a shipping empire. And uh, the William H. Wolf was part of an expansion of the company that also saw the um, the lease of ships for navigation, not only shipbuilding, but they got into ship navigation. So on the day of the launch, uh, th the thousands of people were crowded onto the platforms across from the shipyard, as I had said, and William H. Wolf was concerned that the wave could possibly cause death or destruction or injury to patrons. So he had sent the police to warn the spectators um, over here. Oh, I guess you can't really see what I'm pointing, but over um, across from the ship, he had sent the police to warn them to move away from the dock uh, as there could be some damage, but they didn't listen and uh, two men were killed, unfortunately. Um, so after that, the ship had a long career on the Great Lakes um, carrying coal, uh, carrying coal and other, other, um, sorry, coal, gravel, and other items um, until 1921, that is. Um, in September of, this is William H. Wolf, and this is another view of the Wolf um, steamship after it's launched. Um, while researching this topic, if you are further interested, um, there can be a bit of a rabbit hole in the research as there was also a, a freighter, a modern freighter called the William H. Wolf named for the same William who had built this, the first ship that I am speaking of tonight. So again, a shout out to the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society for use of this photo. Okay, so back to our story. So the William H. Wolf had a rather bland career, no accidents, um, no incidents at all really, until September of 1921. On September 18th, um, it sank earlier, Early in the day at the entrance to the Kiwat in Michigan Harbor on the south shore of Lake Superior. Uh, apparently it had sprung a leak and um, went down in about 20 feet of water. So, sorry, my screen is frozen here. Let me just restart it. Okay, so yeah. Okay, there we go. Sorry again. So it went down about 20 feet of water um, and carry, carrying a, a cargo of coal. So the ship was raised a couple days later on September 23rd. The wooden steamer um, was refloated and sent on its way, although there was some damage to the boat seams that they had to temporarily repair. Um, it had went down after a brief gale, which had caused the leak, but it wasn't actually, um, didn't actually sink due to the storm. Okay, so now further into our story, we come to October 20th of 1921. This is where the action starts on the St. Clair River. Uh, the, after the refloating, uh, the, the William H. Wolf. I was delivering a final cargo and then was on its way to be put up for the winter at Detroit for repairs. For repairs and then around between 1 and 2 a.m. on October 20th, as it was steaming down the South Channel towards Marine City and heavy winds uh, the, near the front of the ship and one of the sailors noticed that there was some smoke and flames and went to investigate and the ship was quickly engulfed in flames. I'm having a little bit of a tech issue here. Okay, here we go. So the ship was on, uh, under the underway and Edward and Edward Henry, the first mate went to investigate the source of the flames in the cargo hold. And it's believed that he was overcome by smoke and he was lost in the fire. Um, all of the 
all of the sailors, the 22 sailors on board, um, were frantically trying to put out the fire. They would quickly raise the alarm. Um, most of them had went to bed as it was after 1 a.m. They were quickly awoken and they screwed on the hose to try to put out the fire. But unfortunately, the ship was quickly engulfed and they had to evacuate. Uh, the captain stayed on the ship along with the wheelsman, Anthony Smith. Uh, they took the ship, the William H. Wolf, towards Fawn Island where they ran it aground. Unfortunately, uh, the wheelsman, uh, the wheelsman, Anthony Smith, he panicked and jumped off of the ship and he was never seen again. Uh, it's assumed that he drowned and his body was um, taken downstream. In the meantime, Captain Hansen uh, was frantically hanging off of the side of the ship on the anchor chain. Um, the heat was very bad. A local citizen from the American side of the river had brought a boat over to try to rescue him, but unfortunately couldn't get close to the ship. So Captain Hansen was encouraged to jump. Uh, he did jump. However, his left leg got caught on the anchor chain and was broken in two spots. In the meantime, the William H. Wolf uh, continued to burn and burned right to the hull. Uh, the next day, the sailors were interviewed and said that they had not seen an ignition source and um, there was no reason for the fire. And the captain was taken to hospital where he recovered. Um, efforts were made to try to find the bodies of the two crewmen, but they were unable to find them. Uh, the William H. Wolf had been on lease as well by a captain from Detroit who also traveled to Marine City to interview the sailors, all of whom were American, most from Port Huron, um, some from Detroit. And uh, there was nothing to add to the story there. So he went to Port Huron without much incident after. Okay, so the, the remains of the wreck today, so it's just south of Fawn Island. So as you can see, Sombra is up here and Fawn Island is about two kilometers south of Sombra and the William H. Wolf sits just to the south of the south end of Fawn Island. Um, it, the wreck is a 285 foot wooden steamer. Uh, it was sunk in October of 19, October of 1921, as I said, and it is now a popular dive site uh, due to the location. It lies in about in two pieces and very shallow water. Um, the, bow, the bow is in the shallow part. Indeed, if you, you, if you look on YouTube, you can see videos of the dive and it's relatively close to the surface. You can see the, the diving on the boat where you see the screws and um, pieces of the wooden hull and a couple of the boilers. It's quite neat to see, even though there are some, there is some, damage from the um, zebra mussels covering the ship. So you might have a hard time telling what you're looking at. Um, but if the diving is also apparently somewhat dangerous. The current at that location can be a uh, two, two miles per hour or about four kilometers per hour, I believe at this spot. There's also a lot of boating traffic, recreational traffic and the dangers of fishing line but it is a popular dive site, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, and also you can view it from the surface if you're not into scuba diving. Um, lastly, here we have a piece of the William H. Wolf. It was recovered by a local diver from the sunken and burned out remains. As you can see, the, the hull is quite charred and uh, there's very, very little of the top part of the ship left. It was quite a hot fire apparently and burned very quickly. Thanks for watching. And that is all from me. Thanks, Kaylin. That was a great presentation. So lastly, moving right along, we have our last uh, presenter is Dave McLean. He is the, um, representing the Forest Museum. David is a retired high school history teacher who taught for 31 years and is currently a volunteer with the Forest Museum and the Plimpton, Wyoming Museum. He holds an honors BA in history from Huron College and a Bachelor of Education from Alt House Teachers College. Go ahead, David. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, Aaron, let's see if I get this up here. There we go. And oops. 
There we go. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed. Uh, I've always had a great interest in, in maritime history and, and shipwrecks and so on. Just tell you a little story. This is not part of my presentation, but quite a few years ago, we were on a family trip to Scotland, kind of a remote area in the West. I don't know if you know the Isle of Mull, the little, little island of Iona is what we were heading to, but we were at the, the little port of Fiona Fort. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I happened to strike up a conversation with a local. He was a, a former British soldier and a crab. So he spent a lot of his life out on the seas. He, he, when he found out he was Canadian, he said, oh, there's a, there's a song, a Canadian song. He couldn't remember the name of it. He said, something about a shipwreck. And I said, I know the one you're talking about, <laughs> the wreck of the Emerald Gordon Lightfoot. And so uh, he said it always brought a tear to his, uh, the eyes of his, uh, he and his mates. And uh, I, I remember when it sank, and I remember when Lightfoot came out with the song, um, I had a soft spot for that song see him performing in car a number of years ago as well so so uh you know good evening to everyone um so i'm presenting tonight on the story of the sinking of the ss manasu on georgian bay in 1928 although this maritime disaster occurred from far from our county um it did have a significant lambton connection and i'll get to that connection shortly uh first of all back around the ship. It was built in the same year as the Fontana, that Nicole mentioned, 1888, Scotland is where it was built. Uh, and the SS Manasu was originally named the SS Makassa, uh, which is an indigenous word meaning beautiful waters. And this image shows the Makassa entering the Burlington Canal in 1888. I suspect it might've been when it just arrived over from Scotland. So this sir as a passenger and package freighter between Hamilton and Toronto for nearly 40 years before being sold to the Owen Sound Transportation Company for use on Lake Huron in 1927. It was renamed the Manasu, um, the name being derived from the Manitoulin and the Sioux in, in honor of one of her new ports of call, Sioux St. Marie, so the Manasu. Um, and any mariners out there will tell you there's a lot of superstition about changing the name of a ship. <laughs> but um, didn't matter. It sailed successfully for, like I say, nearly 40 years. So prior to beginning her new life out of Owen Sound, the Manasu underwent some uh, renovations, including the replacement of her promenade with passenger cabins to allow for overnight journeys. And so I'll just click again here. You can see the section here, which on the left is the Mikasa. It was open for, for the public, you know, to wander around on the, on the promenade. But here on the right, they've turned them into passenger cabins so they could take overnight cruises. Um, after a fairly successful season in the summer of 1908, the Manasu was made available in the fall for special commissions for interested parties. And this is where I can bring in the Lambton County connection to the store. And here's Main Street of Oil Springs. I'm not sure the year of the early 1900s. Um, so in early September of 1928, Donald Wallace, a livestock buyer and a butcher from Oil Springs, booked passage on the vessel, the Manasu. So Wallace was interested in buying cattle on Mantulan Island. In the census, I, I found he was referred to as a drover. Okay, we know what a, a drover was, but he he um, would go through the countryside buying uh, like here and there. So also was interested in buying cattle on Mantulan Island. And for company on the trip, he invited George Lambert to join him. Originally from Warwick Township, George had involved in his family's business in Oil Springs and later purchased a confectionery store in the village. Um, now in, the, in the interest of full disclosure here, George Lambert was a first cousin of my great grandfather, uh, George Liddell. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of, of Lambert to share. I tried to track one down, I couldn't, but I may have one of Wallace here. Um, so I, I put out a call to Aaron uh, at Oil Springs there and said, you have a photo of this gentleman here? And, 
Well, if you look over in the right, and this is a photo I'd seen, but I didn't look close enough. It says Spruill and Wallace Meat Market. And so Aaron had sent me this, this photo and the following one here. Okay, there the arrow's pointing to the sign. So the next slide, look over to the and see Spruill and Meat Market. I don't know, but I'm suspecting that might be Mr. Standing in the door, maybe with a, a butcher's apron on or something there. Um, so thank you to Aaron and Donna at Oil Springs for sharing the photo. So in late August or early September, Wallace and Lambert on their business venture, driving to Owen Sound, Wallace's 1927 Chevrolet, similar to the vehicle here, the 1927 according to my search, Chevrolet Coupe. I, I, color a vehicle they had, but we'll go with this one here. Um, so I'm not certain as to whether it was the Manasu or the SS Manitoulin, a sister ship that the men sailed to Manitoulin on. I, I can't verify that. But the Chevy was loaded on board so that the two men could drive around uh, Manitoulin Island and negotiate purchases from cattle farmers there. Um, okay, so there's Manitoulin Island. And after completing their dealings on Manitoulin, Wallace and Lambert boarded the Manasu at Manitowaning, which you can see on the map there, on September 14th, along with a herd of 116 cattle, 46 of which had been bought by Wallace. Early in the afternoon, the Manasu pulled out of the harbor at Manitowaning, bound for Owen Sound along the route seen on the map, roughly that, that's what they would take. Scheduled to arrive in Owen Sound the next day, uh, later in the June. The Manasu was crewed by 19 men, including its captain, Ross McKay. So although the voyage began uneventfully, the Manasu encountered some rough water and waters as she headed into Georgian Bay. Nonetheless, she labored long without incident until she came abreast of Griffith Island in Colpoise Bay. Um, then at about 2 a.m., things went terribly wrong. The steersman lost control of, the, uh, of her wheel as the ship began to list and was unable to control the rudder as the vessel began to founder. Captain McKay's first instinct was to try to beach the vessel on Griffiths Island. So I've got a little closer up map of it there. Um, but things happened too quickly and the vessel continued to list until its starboard bilge, the bottom of the vessel, cleared the surface. Within a few minutes, the steamship sank beneath the cool waters of Georgian Bay. An inquiry held after the wreck was unable to determine or unwilling to a cause of the disaster. There were a lot of theories thrown out there. So many, and the crew was cleared, others were cleared of any response. But there were many theories put forth, including the idea that hatches or portholes left open, um, allowing water to enter the ship. Maybe the gangplank was left let down. The main speculation was that the cattle had been improperly loaded. That, that made the most attention. It was maybe how the cattle, that Wallace himself told the captain, this isn't right how you're loading my cattle on here. There's too many in one pen. You can't do that. They should be divided up more but the captain brushed them off and, and carried on. So there's suspicion that the cow had been improperly loaded, uh, making it top heavy. Perhaps the cow got spooked by the storm and stampeded to the same side of the ship, causing her to roll. Whatever the case, the Manasu sank fast. Um, the only survivors of the wreck were the captain, three of his crew, and Donald Wallace. Wallace said that the last he saw of his friend, George Lambert, was when the two of them jumped into the water, both wearing life preservers. Unable to swim, Lambert likely succumbed to the cold waters and drowned. Meanwhile, Wallace and the surviving crew members managed to pull themselves aboard a life raft that had come loose from the boat as it went down. Sports and aircraft were able to locate the ship when it became long at Owen Sound. But there was some wreckage that was washing up. There were cattle that were washing up. And there's one um, one of the crew members, his body washed up. So the boat had gone down. But where? Uh, aircraft, boat, nobody could see it. 
And it wasn't until over 60 hours after the sinking of the moon that the five survivors were by someone top Blue Mountain near Collingwood. Of the 21 men aboard the Minnesu, set sail for Owen Sound, Parish. This is a lifeboat from the SS Manitoba, and it's, it went out to rescue the men. Here, the men just about to get on board the, the Manitoba. So these are the, the only survivors. Um, okay, and anyway, so this story grabbed headlines all over the place, you know, wondering where the missing men were and so on. So it was about five years ago that the story of the SS, and oh, this photo shows the, the raft that the men had uh, managed to get on top of and, and uh, survived aboard. Now, it was about five years ago that the story of the SS Manasu once again made headlines. On June 30th, uh, 2018, Chris Cole, who is seen on the right of this photo, he's a well-known author and diver of shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, was part of a team of archaeologists and Jerry El Eliason of Minnesota. After a four search, found the Manasu near uh, Griffith Island, depth of around 60 meters. Amazingly, the vessel was largely intact, uh, sitting on the bottom. A couple more here. Although, and here's the uh, here's the uh, the wheel. Although no human or animal remains were found by the divers. An especially interesting discovery. That's it. That's Wallace's 1927 Chevy Coupe, still on the vessel. Its license plates were still attached, and Cole was able to use those and verify that this was indeed Wallace's car. So that's what Wallace and Lambert had dro driven to Owen Sound, across to Mantulan, driven around Mantulan, and uh, you know the rest of the story here. Um, so anyways, uh, just to finish off here, on oh, there's a side view of the, uh, of the, uh, the car. It's still down there, still under the water. They haven't brought it up or anything. Uh, I'll just finish off here. Uh, this is out at Bethel Cemetery, just a little to the east west in Warwick Township. This is the family uh, plot. And if you look down, second from the bottom, it's George. George His body was never found, but the family inscribed his name on their, their family plot here. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, David. It's very interesting. Um, so I did see some questions uh, uh, come in. Also, I want to give a shout out to Donna. That was completely Donna that found the photo for you from Oil Springs. But uh, I love the other photos that you had in your presentation. Um, so yeah, so there was a few comments and questions that have come in. But before we get to those. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, bring to everyone's attention some community events or some events that are happening at the, the museums. Um, and as Do uh, Dana mentioned, um, they will be having their their grand reopening uh, June 2nd, I think she said. Um, so that's very exciting. I can't wait to go check it out myself. Uh, the Oil Museum of Canada has a virtual talk on May 25th, so in a couple of weeks. Um, it's called Stuck in a Rock, Oil Industry in Craigley. The curator at the Craigley Heritage Depot explores the geological formation that allowed the production of Canadian shale oil, as well as the remarkable history of Ontario's only successful production shale oil manufacturing plant, the Craigley Shale Oil. Registration is uh, required, but it's free. And you can find the link on our uh, website or Facebook page. June 9th um, is a PA day in uh, Lambs County and the Oil Museum of Canada with Shell Canada will be exploring the science and uh, processes used for local refining industry. We'll be having demonstrations of a fluidized bed, discussions about safety devices such as flares and bugs, uh, along with crafts. It's a free event, a free PA day event sponsored by Shell Canada Corona and will run from 11 to 3 p.m. Museums on the Air returns June 17th at the museum. Uh, it's the Lambton County Radio Club will be at the museum between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. And you can see amateur radio operators in action as they connect with museums all over the world. 
And lastly, we have our Black Gold Fest happening July 8th, 11 to 4 p.m. It is a family-friendly community event that celebrates the first commercial oil well in North America. And you can come and rediscover the local oil heritage with fun activities, historical demonstrations, musical entertainment, food, beverages. The admission is uh, free that day. And then at the Forest Museum, they're pleased to join the community in its mu um, mural walk, uh, which is next weekend. Rick Jones, one of the museum volunteers, has painted two large history themed murals that will be on display outside the museum. Uh, the Forest Museum is participating in the townwide yard sale on Saturday, May 27th. So you check out great deals on many household items, including kitchenware, tools, books, furniture, DVDs, children's toys, glassware, and mason jars. And lastly, the museum season kicks off May 30th. Uh, this year, they're celebrating their 60th anniversary, and we're they are planning the events to mark um, uh, to mark the event. So they hope that you can join them. Um, so I did see some questions. Uh, somebody had asked if we were going to speak about the um, harmonic, which we did have a speaker uh, this evening that was going to, but she um, last minute had to um, uh, cancel. Um, but Kaylin, did you want to say anything about it? It says that you're going to answer this. <laughs> oh, I think I clicked on the wrong one. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I have a few artifacts. From the harmonic right here beside me. Can I yeah. do this? So this place not done yet, but we have um, a ship's model of the harmonic that's going to be on display here at Lantern Heritage Museum when we reopen. And uh, those pennies, I don't know how on that stand, there's two pennies that are from the fire um, that happened on the harmonic that will be on display here at Lambton Heritage Museum. So come come to learn more about that once we're open. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Dana. Uh, so sorry, Irene, we don't have uh, more to, to um, information on that to share with you tonight, but uh, I appreciate your interest. Um, I did notice that we had a lot of uh, divers joining us um, tonight. So I don't, know, I don't know why that didn't occur to me that <laughs> people that uh, are interested in diving would find this topic interesting. So that's... Uh, um, fascinating. And um, uh, some people have mentioned that they have dove the, the wolf through the years. And they said that exactly what you said, Kaylin, that the zebra mussels have destroyed it. And, <laughs> um, and seeing the pictures that David, you shared with the, with the, um, the, the other boat, just to see the, the it's covered to imagine that's what it would look like. Cause I'm never going to dive myself. So <laughs> um, Someone did ask, I don't know if anyone would know the answer to this, considering the difficulty of navigation, does anyone know if modern freighters use marine pilots uh, to navigate the St. Clair River? Yes, they do. Yes, they still use pilots because it's a very difficult channel and there is a lot of traffic. So there are professional pilots that help to navigate through the waters. I don't really know any more information about it though. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes is the answer. Um, someone has said, I have dived the Fontana and seen the yawl boat on the bottom near the stern, and there is a small donkey boiler still on the deck. That sounds interesting. Um, Actually, during my presentation, when, when I was thinking of Nicole, because um, when I mentioned that some of the shipwrecks have made it more difficult to navigate the river, the wreck of the Fontana actually changed the current and causes sort of like a whirlwind or a corkscrew current that can make it more difficult for navigation. So it actually caused more wrecks in that sense as well. <laughs> uh, I own the navigation, sorry, the negative of the image of the Northern Queen seen on the left of Mr. Stott's talk. Oh, sorry, yeah. That's cool. The, the, during Greg's uh, um, talk, they're saying that they own the, the 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 photo that you showed just after the storm. Um, and somebody else is commenting. I'm trying to read this before I read it out loud. I have a fully intact teacup uh, that was from the Canada Steamship Lines that was possibly from the harmonic that was found underwater just south of the Blue Water Bridge. That's cool. That is cool. 
Not Oftentimes, enough. instead of washing the dishes, people would throw them overboard and especially chamber pots. We have a couple chamber pots in our collection that were found on in the river due to being thrown overboard from different ships. Wow. Um, I don't think I see anything else if anyone else wants to add. Before we go, um, I forgot in my presentation um, to thank um, some members of the Toronto His Marine Historical Society. They provide a lot of information and research assistance on my presentation. So thanks. <laughs> Um, so if we don't have any other questions coming in, I just want to say on behalf of the Lambton, uh, sorry, the Heritage Sarnia Lambton Museum Network, thank you for attending tonight and continuing to support your local museums. Your support is crucial in allowing us to continue to preserve and share our local history and stories of our community. We look forward to seeing you at our sites. Until next time, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Erin. Bye. Thanks.